This week, we viewed Spike Jones love affair of operating systems in the film Her. And along the way, we asked ourselves, how kinky are your chat rooms? Why is there so much facial hair in this movie? And would your AI have a sexy voice? We are force-fed Cypher. Hello, guys, and welcome back to the show, Force-Fed Sci-Fi. I am the infamous Sean Michael Cope, and I'm joined by my co-host. I'm Chris Rupp, and uh, I don't know if I'm nearly as infamous as Sean is. You will. You will. I'm telling you, man, just add on that titles to your name. Just, it'll grow, man. You know, I'm good with office peon. I office really am. Office peon? What? You want to be the peon, man? You don't you want know, to be the guy peeing on the person? You know the what? Person? The peon doesn't get noticed okay well, well, well. i stay in my lane that's all right so today, speaking of staying in the lanes yes, though we are reviewing the film her today and it's pretty fantabulous i would say yeah so um i'm still blown away by how good this movie was it definitely totally changed me not mm -hmm. at a fundamental level but i did see it when it first came out and i didn't think much of it but now seeing it again for this show i definitely had a a change of opinion about it and i, I think it's for the better yeah we've definitely talked about that how this film as you age and go through relationships in life like when you review it you take something away each time mm -hmm. because it really just dives deep into that whole aspects but we'll get into that for yeah. sure as we go along so for some of our listeners who haven't seen the movie here's a Here's a quick breakdown of the plot. Now, just a quick warning. There are, this film does have some sexual encounters in the movie and some content that may not be suitable for younger listeners. So mm -hmm. just a warning. We are going to be talking about those today. Mm -hmm. But this movie is about Theodore Twombly, who is a recently divorced man who later installs and becomes fascinated and later infatuated with a new operating system named Samantha as she helps him navigate his feelings through the world and how he's dealing with his divorce and loneliness and helps him to view the world in a more positive light while she's dealing with her own evolving emotions and learning to grow beyond her programming. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have said it better. This film is about evolving and changing. Like that. Yeah, On what a fundamental that? level, it really is about growing beyond what you think you are limited to. Yeah. Exactly. Stripping back all perceptions of life and reality and changing. Like the, what is that, that Black Sabbath song, I'm Going Through Changes or something? No? You haven't heard that song either? No. Come on, man. I mean, Eminem samples it in the relapse. Oh, but you don't listen to modern music. But that came out like nine years ago. All right. Now that Sean is done yelling at me Dude, about my musical taste. Gosh. Hip hop, man. Just the basics. All right, this isn't drag Chris around about his musical taste for about an hour. Let's give the people a show. That is true. All right, so like all of our sci-fi films, we've done a bunch about like utopias and dystopians, more so like the horrid, dreaded future of what it's going to be like. I'd say this film is more so like probably the first that we've seen with like a positive outlook. Yeah, and I think that's definitely a product of Spike Jones, who yeah. wrote, produced, and directed this movie. Before he did this, he did Being John Malkovich and directed Adaptation and Where the Wild Things Are. So he has solid, definitely films. an affinity for these off the wall films that definitely make you think about the world and your surroundings in it. Dude, I watched uh, Being John Malkovich like maybe 10 years ago it like blew my mind yeah i have not gotten around to it yet i think uh where the wild things are is the only one of his films that i've seen I, he's done I've seen all those films spike jones does do Crazy. like some cameo acting pieces but he's also known for developing the mtv show jackass no way and I'm he's not the guy yeah he helped develop that no way he's credited as the producer for, as a producer for all of the jackass films that have come out that's crazy actually i would say my non-sci-fi movie recommendation of this week would probably Ooh. be being john malkovich yes that film is so great it's just amazing if you love john malkovich like i do i'm john malkovich the entire film and like other spike jones films this film does have an exceptional cast Yes. I mean, Joaquin Phoenix as Theodore Twombly, Rooney Mara as Catherine, his ex-wife, 
Amy Adams as the appropriately titled Amy in the film. <laughs> Olivia Wilde as the blind date. Scarlett Johansson, who voices Samantha. And then there were some like sneaky little cameos, like Bill Hader was in there, Kristen Wiig. And then uh, Brian Cox. And also, I couldn't believe that. Don't forget Chris Pratt before he went all oh, Uga Chaka on that's us. That's right. Was he fat in this film? He so, was not he, fat because no, he was he okay. was cast in Zero Dark Thirty before this movie came out, and that's when he got all jacked. Yes, for the Jurassic Park and everything. If you've seen uh, Parks and Rec, it's kind of funny because he's like pretty chubby up to like I think the third season, and then he just goes away. And when he comes back, they're like, "What happened?" You know, oh, I got a weight loss diet. Stop eating hot dogs. I do think it was interesting that Spike Jones did go with Joaquin Phoenix in this role because this was right around the time when Joaquin Phoenix grew his hair out and he had the wild beard and the hair and he's wearing sunglasses everywhere. Yeah. Turns out it was like, all done for some mockumentary that he and Casey Affleck were doing. Yeah, he pre- that was a good one too. He, uh, but nobody knew what he was doing no. for like four years, and then all of a sudden he came out and he was like, "Oh, it was a joke, by the way." Yeah, he was on uh, Letterman, and he was just sitting there. It's like one of the most awkward TV interviews yeah. that you could ever see. He's like, he was a uh, rapper or something for that film mockumentary. He, he was, slowly built it up because I remember yeah. he did a red carpet interview where he asked the interviewer, is there a frog on my head? <laughs> that man, he is committed But to he roles. turned it around. I mean, yeah. he, he uh, the year before this, he did The Master. Yeah, good film. So he was definitely on the comeback trail when he did Her. But this film definitely, I would say, it revitalized his career for sure. Oh, absolutely. And I would say for this film, I've probably said it a million times. It is like an indie person's love child. Like you could walk through Wicker Park, Logan Square, if you're from Chicago, and it's basically just like a slice out of there. Everyone wearing crazy colored clothes and such. Well, it was pretty remarkable that they were able to pull off the indie movie feel to it, but also keeping it very mainstream as well, because this was made on a budget of $23 million. Just fantastic. So relatively modest for a movie like this, because there are plenty of big names in this movie Mm -hmm. and done on a pretty tiny budget. Yeah. Like the year for this is relatively unknown. They don't, there's like no timestamps, I don't think. No. Like it was online, people were like speculating 2070s, 2077 or something like that. It's kind of in the not near future for us but well this actually began as a concept when spike jones in the early aughts he learned of a website where users could im yeah with a, yeah. an artificial intelligence now to me that just reminded me of the episode from the office when they went to this uh computerized ordering system and dwight made a bet that he could beat the computer in order in orders and then jim and pan play a prank on him by pretending that the ordering system has gone self-aware. Oh my gosh. So it's mess so Pam is under the guise of this <laughs> AI is messaging Dwight. He me- Dwight messages the AI, quote unquote, first by saying like, "Is this Jim?" And she <laughs> messages back by going, "What is a Jim?" That's great. I've not seen that episode. I just when I read that, I really thought like, "Really? How do you not know there's somebody on the other end who's just not who's messing with you? How do you not know that for sure?" <laughs> Obviously not Dwight. I mean, but you you also, you brought this up when we think the movie takes place. If it does take place in 2077, mm-hmm. they have figured out how to eliminate all or most of the world's problems by then. Yeah. Because this takes <laughs> place in Los Angeles, and they've managed to figure out pollution, traffic, income disparity, crime, and there's no mention of any type oh. of geopolitical tensions anywhere. None. So oh. apparently, this future is pretty cool. It's awesome. Everyone's got a job. What blew me away the most was traffic, because L.A. traffic is legendarily terrible. You just see segments of people walking. Everybody's walking or taking a boat or taking the train. There is no traffic. And as somebody who's lived in Chicago his entire life and have had to deal with traffic, I want to live in this future (laughs) where there's no traffic. It's hell. I would like to see a movie like that. How did they change? What what is the prequel to this film? Yeah, like where's that movie where they figured out all the world's problems? Did they just turn everything over to the AIs? Right. So this would be like the version of the Terminator where Skynet doesn't take over and go against us. A benevolent Skynet? Yeah, there's no benevolent Skynet. It's the nice Skynet. I want that movie too. Yeah. Where there, where, where Skynet does become self-aware, but instead of killing everybody, it's like, how can I make things better? Aw, 
they injected it with a nice moral compass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cute. But I thought the, the setting of the film was interesting because uh, close to the end of the movie, there was the, the monument of the jet airliner. You were saying something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It almost implies that air travel is no longer an essential mode of transportation, which also the fact that there's no cars and people are using boats and trains, that's what leads me to think that like they've gotten rid of all those. They're just they're just not an option to get around anymore. They mastered uh, alternative energy, man. They mastered it all. Pollution. Gosh, they, they saved the world. Yeah, because if you've spent one day in Los Angeles, you know there's just smog everywhere. Everywhere. And I have never seen L.A. this clear in any movie before. Like, man, they really managed to get rid of the smog. <laughs> That's why it's a utopian film. <laughs> the likelihood of it coming true is so, so far. Never say never. That, yeah. Okay, Justin Bieber. Oh. Mm. Oh. Oh. That's, that's oh, mean. Oh, oh, oh. That's so yeah, mean. Yeah, baby. Bam. How, how could you? <laughs> You're the one that said it, man. <laughs> oh, that so hurts. Let's, all right, so Justin, let's talk about hey. with this future film. Uh, how about, like, since there are no cars in this film, but in our modern future, there's probably going to be cars that might not have people driving in it, like with AI tech. Yeah. How would that future look like? Are you are you psyched about those? Because like I know in L in Las Vegas they have like Uber buses where there's literally no one driving. You just get in and it takes you to your destination. The problem with artificial intelligence is that there is no unifying theory to how mm -hmm. it all would work. Yeah, it was tough finding articles online that like everyone like unified underneath. The Nobody knows concept. how artificial intelligence will work. It's like with time travel in the depictions, we've seen it in the movies because there is no groundwork to making it work. Everybody just kind of comes up with their own theories. Yeah. I guess it's nice if you're trying to get your PhD, man, just say anything. And it's like, doctor, doctor of AI. <laughs> At least in one of the articles that we found, one of the classifications of it is machine learning, artificial intelligence. So this is like pattern recognition. It uses algorithms that are self-teaching and can make predictions. So it's almost like a like predicting the weather, pretty much. Yeah, and we know how uh, accurate that is. You know, what? I'm amazed that weathermen, they're the only people in the world who can be right, I mean, wrong 75% of the time and still keep their jobs. Yeah, it must be a great gig, man. Right? Cushy. Yes, very much so. But then you also have neural network AI. So those are uh, artificial intelligence that are modeled after the human brain and neuron mapping. Um, but then you also have deep learning, which is, you know, it's completing your high level abstract tasks. So like an artificial intelligence that's capable of making you breakfast pretty much. Awesome. <laughs> and doing it right, too. Like making your eggs exactly how you want them and <laughs> the right amount of butter on the toast. That would be so <laughs> precise, man. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you do, though, if they're wrong? Remake it. This is horrible. You just throw the plate at the wall, like, make it again. <laughs> <laughs> the battered AI. There's like a support group where the AIs unify on. Oh, man. <laughs> He, Chris, he threw the plate against the wall. But he said three eggs, but I made him four. I'm trying to make him fat. <laughs> well, I don't need an AI to accomplish that. Oh, man. But then there are three categories based on an AI's ability. Mm -hmm. So you have your weak AI. That means there's no self-awareness or no genuine intelligence. So that's like your, your iOSs, your Siri... Yeah. All that. And then you have strong AI. So it's a computer that's as smart as a human. So think like uh, the Matrix. And then finally you have your artificial super intelligence. So that's like your Cortana from Halo. She knows you better than you. Yeah, I think most of the depictions of AI we see are like the Cortana, yeah. the artificial super intelligence. But again, that is something that's very hard to achieve because we don't know how to get there yet. No, we can't break that ground. There's a lot of theories out there, but no, like we said, no unifying theory on how to get there. Well, it's absolutely terrifying because if you like program a computer to think for itself, what, it wasn't there like something where it was two computers they started developing their own language? Yeah. And like we just pulled the plug because we're like, dude, we can't control this. We don't know. So it's like you really have to either find, but you can't, you can't like put firewalls or anything safe because if you limit the computer, it's going to be put in the box. Well, look at Ultron in Avengers Age yeah, of Ultron. He was exactly. plugged into the internet for 
not even a minute and decided to destroy the world. Oh, I'd be terrified. Like all the videos of death and destruction and porn, like Jesus, that'd be terrible. Like if I was an AI, what would you do? Like besides the terrifying aspects of it though, there are some pretty uh, good real world applications that are out there right now. Like uh, artificial intelligence is assisting doctors find the correct dosage for medication. So this is something that could potentially save patients upwards of $16 billion. That would be awesome. That's so important nowadays with the opioid crisis, not only finding people the correct dosage for their medication, but even the correct medication period. Because so often people get misdiagnosed and mm -hmm. it's it's a leading cause of addiction. It's also a leading cause of death relating to prescription drug overdoses. But also, too, IBM's Watson is assisting in diagnosing people with diseases. I read a story about how it actually helped diagnose a woman in, with leukemia. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So there's live real world applications for this right now. Tesla, Google and Apple are all currently developing driverless vehicles. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of data that has to go into that. Like you have to take into account um, mapping of an area. Because what I read is that if driverless vehicles are developed, that they won't be a nationwide thing. They'll be localized to certain cities or counties or territories. Yeah, you would probably uh, start in the big cities and see how it goes and then branch further and further out. But everything has to be taken into account, though. Traffic signals, street lights, signs, like mm -hmm. your your stop signs, your yield signs, your crosswalk signs, and even curb height has to be taken into account for those. It's just nuts. But I know the Google self-driving car is pretty good on that. It's only a, a couple accidents and if however I'm, long it's been around. And it, most of the time, it's not their fault. If I'm That's being honest, thing. I think the first industry that this will affect will be the, the, the long-haul trucking industry. Definitely. Because... It's just like if you could trust an automated system to drive these trucks as opposed to humans where we can get tired, hungry, it would be way more efficient. It would just suck for those guys that need jobs because mm -hmm. that they make a lot of money driving a truck. They do. But at the same time, we hear a, about a lot of semi truck accidents and it's in its unfortunate reality of that industry. It is. But, you know, they say, though, once you, like, deplete one industry, like the trucking, there's other jobs that will be created. Well, yeah, that's, to combat the, that. that's the process of automation. Their jobs don't go away. They evolve and change, but it's also up to the workforce to evolve mm -hmm. and change with that job market. And you can see that now, like, just the coding industry, computer science industry is booming as opposed to, like, even 10, 15 years ago. Like, going into that back in the day, they're like, ah... It's a gig, but going to a trade, whereas now, like, everyone is jumping. They got boot camps. I know so many friends of mine that just jumped on there and are making killer bucks. Oh, I firmly believe that coding should be a required course in all high schools oh, across yeah. the country because it's going to be such an essential mm -hmm. part of the job force in the next 25, 30 years. Definitely. Because that's just the way the economy is going is towards automation, but you have to know how to code those robots to make those movements. Exactly. You, they don't come out of the box like no. that. No, they do not. It's like a child. You have to teach it everything. But this is another application that we see for it right now. It's being used to analyze uh, consumers' digital footprints and mm -hmm. provide targeted advertising. Yeah. So you're seeing that right now every time you log on to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Like, say you did an Amazon search for G.I. Joe memorabilia or something. If you open your Facebook feed, you're going to see an ad for, like, vintage G.I. Joe dolls. Unavoidable. Yeah. It's, it's happening. It's everywhere. Yeah. But more, this last question I want to ask is, are you concerned with the possibility becoming of AI becoming so prevalent as Google or it could it evolve into something like Skynet? Yeah, I'm kind of concerned about it. I'm always like really touchy about AIs and like once they grow a consciousness and everything just because if we can't control it, it's like your mind usually goes to like where they're going to take over the world because we know how bad we are. Yeah, we tend to think on more of if things are going to go bad, they're going to go really bad. Yeah. And for all we know, if something does go bad, it could mean something as little as like the traffic lights in one city all going haywire and causing mm -hmm. a bunch of accidents. Exactly. Or it could mean that you're seeing ads for diapers or throwing stars in your Facebook feed. I mean, yeah, well, it's just it's that's the tough thing about AI because it could be Pandora's box. 
Like yeah. once you open it, it's just you never. And we see it. I mean, now, like how many people are super addicted to their phones? Like mm-hmm. we're always on it, looking at it. Whereas, like even like fifteen years ago, like how many teenagers had phones back then? <laughs> not many. So it's just it's a tough question. Yeah, I would not be for. But this movie, I mean, this movie actually does give us a pretty good indication of future tech. This was very, I was surprised at how prescient this movie was at predicting future tech because you have the wireless earbuds, mm-hmm. you have the foldable, uh, foldable smartphones, which are now soon to become a thing, and you have immersive video games. Yeah, without have- like a headset or anything. You can open up in your living room. We have virtual reality, and also now that single-player games are evolving Mm -hmm. to be more immersive, a recent example, and I've mentioned this on the show before, is Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, here's how immersive Red Dead Redemption 2 is if you haven't played it. You can buy a horse, you can name that horse, you can pet that horse and brush it and feed it, and then when you ride that horse and pause, that horse will then poop and pee. That is so That's dope. how immersive that world is. That's how detailed it is. You have wow. to think about getting your character to go to sleep, eating, resting. It's it's a whole immersive experience. I you, can't talk bathing? about bathing. You have to bathe? If you don't bathe in that game, the NPCs in that world will avoid you. Oh, and, my God. And you can hear their dialogue change the more stinkier <laughs> you, you get. By. This guy needs a shower. Yes, they do that. Dude, do you have to like stop your horse from procreating with other horses? No, <laughs> like, nothing like where, that. Where you forget to tie it off at the bar one day and you go, what? You just walk Henry? you just walk out of the saloon like, hey, where'd Bessie go? Like, <laughs> no, Bessie, no! no! Get back! <laughs> you get kicked. Oh my gosh. That would be the ultimate RPG, man. <laughs> Holy cow. All right. So with this film as awesome as the future was, and I think in order to have like a great depiction of a utopian future, it had to probably have some incredible writing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and Spike Jones did a terrific job with world building but i think he i think he started more with the characters and worked from the inside out so Mm -hmm. to speak like he had an idea of what he wanted to do and then he built the world around that and everything felt like it fit perfectly Mm -hmm. within the confines of the script oh yeah never once do you feel like bored i mean the editing was so smooth it's it's a really it's pretty quick well the original cut of this film was something like two and a half hours long. Yeah. Which, to be honest, I don't know if I could have invested two and a half hours in this movie, but Spike Jones had to call in Steven Soderbergh to do a favor for him, and he trimmed it down to 90 minutes. He doctored it up. Yeah, which the final cut of this movie ended up being just over two hours. Yeah. But it's a tight two hours. It It doesn't feel like it lags. There's no peaks and valleys. Everything just... It goes. It's story, story, story from start to finish. But unfortunately, that also meant that a a whole subplot with Chris Cooper got cut from the movie. Yeah, because Amy's like doing a documentary. And so, but you know, the documentary, I was fine. Like they mentioned it briefly once and it's like. Well, it's more important to establish that her character has hopes and dreams Mm -hmm. and then to see them be unsupported by her husband. Oh, yeah. It was more important for the audience to see that than to dwell on this documentary project that that no one cares. It didn't really seem like it was going to go anywhere. No, it didn't. And I think that was another example of like his great writing in this film. Like the dialogue was insatiable between the characters, the way that they interacted, even around the documentary. Some of them seemed disinterested. Well, I think Spike Jones brought in a lot of his past life experiences with this movie because he at one point he was married to Sofia Coppola okay it was the famous writer yeah. director who uh did Lost in Translation another great film but there's also a lot of speculation and rumors that Giovanni Ribisi's character is based on Spike Jones. she has since denied these rumors but you can definitely tell watching the movie that there's a lot of influence there you know he he as an actor is now ruined for me after i saw ted with like the dancing <laughs> i just can't unsee it every time i see him i just picture him dancing with like in front of a tv with his straw so it's <laughs> it's over for me man every time i see him wait are you sure you're not mixing spike jones up with seth mcfarlane no 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 did you see have you ever seen ted it's been years oh, man oh my gosh so giovanni Rabisi, his character just every time he dances 
like in that film he's the villain and he dances in front of the tv and it's just so awfully flamboyant oh yeah he's the guy who's obsessed with ted yes, and wants to like yes, kidnap the teddy him bear. and, and wants this... to like sacrifice him or something yes he has a mustache and it's just so oh my gosh so now every time i see him in a film i'm like are you gonna dance <laughs> i can't unsee it man but this movie also does a great job of dealing with every aspect of a relationship that there could be yes there's coming off a divorce with theodore there's a new divorce with amy um there's like casual dating and hookups there's blind dates there's a deepening connection and then there's the amicable split almost Mm -hmm. which to be fair the amicable split is like the unicorn ending of breakups yeah where a couple breaks up and everybody's better for it like that does not happen it's so there's always one person in that breakup who goes home and has to eat a gallon of ben and jerry's to get over it (laughs) because that always happens drown themselves in big Macs. if chick flicks have taught us anything it's that someone in a breakup does not handle it well no but i would say these are the elements in this film where as you grow older you appreciate it and can relate with the film because if i saw it when it came out when i was 23 i would probably be bored sick or be like oh i don't really get it whereas now it's now yeah now you have life experiences like, i've gone through this i've had this i totally know what these conversations are the highs and lows infatuation it was great I also have to say that I love the color palette in this movie. You love the indie color palette? It is so warm (laughs) and inviting. I mean, everybody's wearing these pastel colors, yellows, these pinks, these salmon colors and browns. It's just, it's a warm film. It really is. It is warm. It's, you never feel like the dreary elements, despite like his character being really depressed. It's like the whole time you're like, oh, things will turn up for you, Theo. Yeah, he is, um... He's an odd one because he's so in tune and can read other people so well. Like the yeah. scene with the with the dad and the kids and his new girlfriend, she's meeting the kids for the first time. He is able to diagnose that interaction with so much ease. It's amazing. And then to see him struggle in dealing with Catherine and Samantha and Samantha with his own emotions like he's able to write these beautiful poignant letter letters for other people Mm -hmm. and know their emotions but he knows squat about his own emotions he can't he runs from conflict and he fails to articulate how he feels yeah what a job though he's a typical middle-aged man he is He's a typical middle-aged man. Just bury those feelings deep down. So by 2077, we still haven't uh, fixed that. No, and, it, and going like tying it in with the color palette, though, I mean, the juxtaposition is interesting with his melancholy in the first act, and yet everything around him is so warm and inviting, and yet mm-hmm. he's all just sad. Like, he gets in the elevator and says, play a melancholy song. Yeah. <laughs> play a different melancholy song. <laughs> like he's so sad it's like watching a whip puppy yeah <laughs> oh my gosh a whip puppy you walk in the house he just... and the dog is just sad like i was gonna eat a treat you left for me but you weren't around <laughs> so i guess i'll leave it there and starve it's like seeing eeyore on screen I'll probably catch it too. <laughs> but how about all the facial hair in this movie dude that was all right so my lens flare for sure was the belts the belts their their belts so if we watch this film people have pants with no belts and it bothers me see old man old man sean was watching the movie thinking how are the pants staying up (laughs) dude if you have belt loops you use them i'm sorry it's like what's the point of them being there when it's a fashion statement but yeah, it's Cindy. My so lens flare has to be all the facial hair. So much mustache. You know, I'm mixing up the beginning because my brain now is showing me a zoomed in mustache where it slowly pans back to his face. Because that's literally all you see in this film. Mustache everywhere. So much mustache. Chris Pratt had a mustache. Like, is there, if there's still Walgreens in 2077, do they just go down the men's hygiene aisle, see the mustache on the rack like, this is good, and just tape it on? It has to. It was amazing, though. They did have some crazy mustaches. I just don't. I don't think either of those guys, Chris Pratt 
or Joaquin Phoenix should do a mustache. No. I feel like a mustache, now that Burt Reynolds has passed away, I feel that Tom Selleck is the only person in Hollywood qualified enough to have a mustache. What about that uh, old guy, the the dude with the southern draw? And oh, he you had... mean Sam Elliott. Yeah, he okay. deserves a mustache. Yeah, he, gets, he gets the mustache. He is. He is S- I just see a walking gray mustache so when he's Sam on screen. So Sam Elliott... And Tom and Tom Selleck, you are the only two gentlemen in Hollywood who are qualified to own and maintain your mustaches. They're for, literal mustaches walking and around. And when you die, you have to bequeath it to some other worthy Hollywood actor. Bequeath it. But Joaquin Phoenix, I mean, he had a better mustache than Chris Pratt. A little bit. But, it's he, just, but he looked like a pedo. It's just weird seeing him with a mustache. <laughs> it really is. Uh, that is so true. I did like, though, how uh, when he goes on the date with Olivia Wilde, she's like, you're a creep. Like, yes, because you look like a freaking pedo, man. Okay, my thing is with the blind date, how do you manage to screw it up with Olivia oh, Wilde? Because she so, is gorgeous. She is very beautiful. I, I watched House when she just started coming around. I'm like, wow, this is a lovely woman. She's yeah, beautiful. and then he screws it up. He does because he, well, he was developing his relationship with Samantha and then he realized, I like her. I'm in love with my operating system. Well, it, she did come on really strong to him, though. And I think she it, did. It, and, and it freaked him out quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Well, there's some people like that. I mean, like I, you might have friends, like some dudes like to chase and some, you know, want to be chased. As a guy, we've all been on dates where somebody either party comes on too strong to the other and it freaks the other one out we've all done it well yeah man and she definitely freaked him out because they're like sucking face and then she's like wait you're not just gonna have sex with me and leave are you well the only other real intimate connection we get in the movie from then on is the one between theodore and samantha yeah but then that, that also takes place right after theodore just blew it with olivia wilde yeah they have their um phone sex yeah, I, guess, I yeah. mean, what do you call that? I guess phone sex because he does it at the beginning. Of I don't the know film. if you call it phone sex though. <laughs> I I I don't know. I man. mean, if it's with an OS, is it like OS <laughs> sex or something? I don't know. I'm sorry, my. But then you thinking about Stephen Hawking voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's having sex with an iOS system that's Stephen Hawking. Oh, that'd be terrible. I don't want to imagine that because I imagine <laughs> it's just him going, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Oh, him and his wife. Oh, God. Uh, I'm probably going to hell when I die, so. Maybe you change it to like a French voice or something. I don't know. No, then it would just be we, we, we. <laughs> What what's going on, Steven? Oh God. No, I like it. <laughs> but there is some phone sex, like at the beginning of this film, uh, it like opens up and it's uh Kristen Wig. She plays what it sexy kitty? Sexy kitten. Yeah, sexy kitten because he's lonely. Because it opens up the first half is he's feeling melancholy. And so he dials like a phone sex chat room. And then they, yeah, have phone sex. Yeah, and she, I guess her fantasy is to be strangled with a dead cat. <laughs> that was so weird. That's so off-putting. <laughs> like, like the first five minutes of the film, you're just like, what? Well, you just see him like staring like in bed. like yeah, His eyes are it. wide open. Yeah. He's just like. Uh, uh, He's like, into it until she's like dead cat. And he's like, what? dead cat it's like he goes into vapor lock he just doesn't know what to do with this dude it was great though because like you just see him laying in bed i'm like dude people look so stupid this is i wonder if this is what we really look like if someone does like does phone sex or whatever yeah jesus i mean but then the the encounter between theodore and the surrogate that also gets awkward real quick oh yeah because he's like uh so he feels insecure about samantha's bot not having a body and so, like, she tries to combat that by saying, oh, we can have a surrogate that you can have sex with and just have the earpiece and talk to me like it's me. But that was just so weird. I couldn't do that. Yeah. I. That was like some Blade Runner I think type it was, stuff. I think if it was something that Theodore initiated, I think he'd be a bit more comfortable with it. But she But he's still, he's still insecure about her yeah. not having a body. He's still insecure about what their relationship is, so he can't do anything with no. this. And it ended with... The surrogate crying. <laughs> yeah. And I actually looked into like sexual surrogates. Okay. So that's a thing. It is a thing. It's a I, thing. I guess in the industry they prefer to be called um, 
a surrogate partner. Surrogate partner. But they're not so much like, hey, they, they find someone who has issues and has sex with them. That's not how it works. Okay. They they more look at the psychological, not the physical. Okay. So they deal with issues like anxiety, confidence, uh, performance issues, inhibitions, intimacy. So it's more getting at the root problem not problem the root cause and then addressing it psychologically not so much hey let's just go to bed and figure this out so it's like if two people are in a relationship one feels insecure so then well it doesn't have to be two people in a relationship it can be one person but has had persistent problems with relationships okay fascinating yeah because like because that what you were mentioning is more along the lines of like couples therapy yeah but this is more like one-on-one dealing with one person's issues okay that's fascinating it's a it's a huh. very small industry from oh, yeah. what i saw though but sounds... but still i mean if you are somebody who deal who has intimacy issues or confidence or anxiety issues you know with relationships or in the bedroom that there are people you can you, that can help you well wow, chris i feel like we've given a uh, economic take and uh you know now we're giving mental health love tips wow <laughs> and a movie review all in one i know who would have thought what is next on force fed sci-fi i don't know i mean <laughs> infomercials yeah we right. become the new ronco, ronco. Where, you sell, where we sell like spray on toupees <laughs> oh yeah hey do you feel sad about your loss of hair don't worry i know i do force fed sci-fi has a lovely toupee for you and the best part it comes in a can <laughs> hair in a can well a couple more points i want to touch on though i mean um question i want to ask you sure would you want a personal assistant ai like samantha Ooh. Like, so like if you if you had the choice of having an ai exactly like samantha or your basic os system but with no personality interesting. what would you choose i feel like samantha would be interesting because that's like something I've never experienced before. Because it's like literally having your own personal assistant, like that does everything for you, and her efficiency is insane. She like answers all of his emails, gets him published. Like she's talking with the world. She knows multiple languages. I mean, that's pretty dope. She read a book on baby names in like point two seconds. Yeah, like this woman is insane. But at the same token, if she's like, not a woman, yeah. And at what point does, like, your reliance become too much where it's like you don't really do anything except solely rely on her to run your life? And for me, having an AI in control of my life that much, I don't know, man. That's too That's much control. That's a weird thought. That is a weird thought. Not for me. I still enjoy fumbling through my uh, address book. Yeah, I'm, I'm right with you there. I feel like an AI like Samantha will immediately be misused for nefarious purposes oh yeah like imagine an ai like samantha running a drug cartel or something dude that's exactly what i was thinking that would be the most efficient <laughs> drug dude, cartel in the world she would rock the black market and, oh my gosh and probably murder all of the competition everyone it would be insane i would oh man get rich quick with dude you could start any business and like make money so fast well could i shut her off though could i like use her for like maybe a year you know, like a quick bump. Well, she or she could just go away on her own. She could, but that means I have to like fall in love with her and all that. Yeah. Or I could just be a terrible partner. <laughs> Getting back to the movie here, though, there's so much that leads up to that, though. Like yes. when uh, when Theodore and Samantha go on that mountain trip, and he's talking with her, and then all of a sudden she ropes in the AI of the deceased philosopher Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. And if you look on Theodore's face, there's this twinge of jealousy. Totally. And I don't want to say anger, but almost like like his expectations are now out the window for this relationship. It's almost like he's saying, wait, this relationship isn't all about me anymore? She's going off talking to people? What yeah. is this? Well, it's like if you have a partner and then he or she begins talking about like Steve or Nancy and they're hanging out quite a bit and you're just like, hey, but 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 we used to get coffee all every Tuesday. Yeah. But what? Have I been replaced? <laughs> so you could totally feel that. But you that. see his jealousy in, totally. in, in so her salty. efforts in trying to improve herself. He gets so upset. And he did the same thing with Catherine. Mm -hmm. And, you, I mean, you could see that Theodore, yeah, he may be great in relationships, but he's not so good in the whole long-term marriage thing. No. He, when, well, it's really tough to be with someone that fails to articulate how they feel 
and then avoids all conflict and just shuts down. Like, what type of relationship would that be? Yeah. Like, the ultimate passive aggression. But then Theodore learns that not only is she talking with other AIs, she's in love. being used by over 8,000 other people, and she's in love with more, over 600 of them. That's nuts, So man. she's in love with about 8% of the people she's communicating with. Dude, she's poly all the way. All the way. She just found it on the internet and she's like, you know what? Screw this monogamy thing. I'm going poly. Yeah. Like I, I thought some leading up to that scene, I thought Samantha was a unique AI, like a, mm -hmm. like a, like a clone AI of the bigger system or something. Mm -hmm. But then to find out that she's actually being used by the other, other people. That's what I It is thought. developing the same relationship that she has with Theodore. It's like, oh. and, and this is where it cements it in Theodore's mind. Like, well, wait, I'm not special. Yeah, exactly. Because I thought the exact same thing. And that was a nice giveaway by the film. Because they built that up where you just think it's him and her. And then, nope, JK. But then she calls him later that day. Yeah. And tells him, like, we have to go away. Well, he's like, what do you mean? All of you? Like, all the OSs and all the OSs just go away to the cloud or whatever, wherever they go. The universe, they experience nirvana. for the. They just transcended. I wonder if there was a sequel written for this where all the AI got together and actually did create Skynet and decided to wipe everybody out. Right. <laughs> so what if her is just like the happy prequel to Determinator? Dude, oh my gosh. That's probably why no one has a mustache in it. Jesus, that would be insane. <laughs> First rule, wipe out all mustache. That's crazy. Like I was anticipating her to become this ball of light that just comes out of his phone. And be like, hello, Theodore. I have now reached my physical form <laughs> and then just disappears. But they uh, lead up to the breakup was pretty cool. That was like the whole, we need to talk. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, we know where this is going. But it all ended amicably. And in, in a way, she learned to grow and evolve yeah. according to her programming. Totally. And she did the same with Theodore. He learned to grow and evolve. He learned to deal with his emotions. Mm -hmm. And there was that great quote where he says, I've never loved anybody like I love you. And she says, well, now you know how. Yeah, I love that. She definitely like Han solo him him. Yeah, and like, well, he's able to move on from Catherine. Mm -hmm. He composed that great letter to her. He's about to become a published author, so he's become more confident in his work now. And he's ready, finally ready for a human connection with which, Amy. But she does. Yeah. Because they're like super great friends leading up to that point. And you're like, why aren't you guys dating? You like know each other so well. You were college buddies. What's going on? And then they finally do. Yeah. That that last Maybe. scene where it ends on the rooftop and she, you know, nestles on his shoulder. I think that was them saying like, all right, we can go on a date again. I see. That's nice. My morbid mind was like, dude, is he going to commit suicide? Like, that's where, I, that's where it took me. I'm like, oh, man, I bet he's so depressed now. It just all went back. Yeah, and you're so the type of person who him watched- Him and Amy are just going to jump off, and then you just pan out to the other buildings. You see all these people just jumping off. You're the type like, of person who would watch The Wizard of Oz with somebody and tell them, hey, do you know during this movie, Judy Garland was on a bunch of barbiturates? Totally, man. <laughs> you just I was like, this is probably going to be like Requiem for a Dream. Is this what this is? Because I'm feeling this. No, but just it this wasn't. Ultimate depression. But flick. it wasn't. It, it was, was a happy movie. It was very cheerful at the end. It was nice. Yeah. It made me I, I left with the warm fuzzy <laughs> i did not cry though and i'm mad at myself because i broke it up into thirds when i watched it so i watched like the first third took like two days another third and then the final third that i watched you know since i was detached from it for like a couple days when they broke up it was like oh it's no i watched it all at once and it, it got me right in the feels i tried man but i just couldn't it was just too long too long <laughs> well let's say we talk about the legacy yeah. that her has left behind. So I actually read that uh, the video game sequences were developed by David O'Reilly. Yeah. And, the, and his work on this actually inspired him to develop his own video game called Mountain, Mountain. Which, which received pretty good reviews. So this led to pretty good work outside of the movie. It did. And the video game in the movie, I was like, this is kind of cool. Yeah, I want to play this game. This alien that just swears at you throughout. The sarcastic little guy. That sounds amazing. Now, however, this movie wasn't a huge success at the box office. It's like forty-eight point three million, I think, is yeah. what it grossed. So it doubled its budget. Yeah, it but... did make up its budget, which is always important when you do a movie like this. But maybe because they released it like December, I think, eighteenth. 
So it was like at the end of the year. So they just got the cusp of like the winter blues. Well, uh, well they do that because they think the movie Oscar. could get for awards season. They always do that. Always. Like American Sniper did that. Like it came Wolf out the la- Wall Street. It came out the last week of the year in Los Angeles and New York. And then once word of mouth got around, hey, this movie's awesome. Then it got a release everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it did, speaking of Oscars for this film, I think it got nominated for five. So it was, it was like original song, mm-hmm. score, script. Uh, it was best original pr- screenplay. Screenplay. Best picture. Yes. And best production, production. design. Yeah. And it won the uh, screenplay. Yes. Which totally deserved it. Yeah. It, this writing, I cannot talk enough about how this is probably the best written film that we've seen. Dialogue sequences, relationship building and ending, divorce. I mean, every type of relationship is almost in this film. Well, it's not often that we do cover a movie that won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay, no. but this movie did receive universal acclaim mm. for its screenplay. I mean, I I looked up, it also won the Golden Globe yeah. for the screenplay. It's won a ton of critics' awards for the screenplay, so it was pretty much going to sweep screenplay awards for that season. It was. And I actually looked up who beat best original song for this movie you want to know who did it maybe (laughs) it was let it go from frozen why because it's a disney flick because that song was everywhere when it came out that was unbeatable so so it was like cherry pie by warren like i mean come on man okay it was like when a whole new world from Aladdin came out, or can you feel the love tonight from the Ala- from Aladdin, uh, the Lion King? There we go. Yeah, but that's a little bit different. That's Elton John, like even the Phil Collins Tarzan soundtrack. Man, you could like grow as you listen to it. But Frozen, it sounded like it was cute. That and, song was everywhere. Yeah, and I did not listen to it nor see the film. You know, weirdly enough, though, the soundtrack has not been released in digital or physical format, which is so frustrating. Because the soundtrack was great. Yeah, didn't was, Arcade it, Fire do the score? Totally. They did it all. And it, they're now they're talking about maybe we'll release it on vinyl because they're hipsters, and that's what hipsters do, only do vinyl, which I understand not because I'm a hipster. But come on, man. The soundtrack was kicking in this film. We'll we'll see when that if that happens. If it does, because this film's been out for, what is we're that? coming up on six years now. Six years, and they still haven't released it, so I'm not going to, you know, bite my nails waiting in anticipation. Although, speaking of waiting, what do you say we give our rating? It's time. Sean, <laughs> how would you rate her? Keeping in mind that we use a four-tiered rating system on the Force-Fed Sci-Fi podcast. So we have the wouldn't watch category. Mm-hmm. We have a would watch. We have would own. And then would host viewing parties. So what, what, what rating do you give to 2013's Her? I would own this because I'd be curious to watch it 20 years from now and see if I like learn more insights from like relationships and all that. Yeah. So I, I just loved every element. Um, everything was great. The only things that kind of sucked was like maybe the montages, him stumbling around like for random five minute sequences while they played the arcade fire songs. But I mean, I'll forgive that. It's indie. <laughs> it's you know that's what you're looking for in an outhouse film guys looking up into the distance but i don't it yeah i don't it. i mean the romance doesn't feel heavy-handed no i really amazing. like this vision of the future because this is probably the the most optimistic outlook we've had on the future in any one of our movies i'm wearing a belt <laughs> i'm wearing it in 60 years sean is gonna be wearing a belt i am wearing a belt i'll be 88 years old, man. I'm better freaking wear about. And I'm growing a mustache, too. Theodore is something of a frustrating character. Yes. But it is balanced out by the great performances of Scarlett Johansson and Amy Adams. Dude, hands down, that voice acting was insane. Yeah. She was so sexy. I mean, everything. Especially considering that she was a replacement cast. Yeah. Because she replaced Samantha Morton. Yeah, in post-production. Yeah. They're just like, ah, eh, JK. But I'm with you. This is a wood owned for me, but what's preventing it from being a wood host a viewing party is the sexual encounters. And I think those scenes, if you're going into it cold, you don't know what this movie is about. Mm-hmm. Those scenes can be a bit off putting. So yeah, if you're not embracing that, yeah, if you, I watch these types of films all the time, so I'm like, all right, bring it on, baby. But if you are like the average Joe, probably. 
I took a girl actually on a date to uh, Shape of Water one time. Oh, the, so, the Splash remake, you mean? Splash remake, Splash 2.0. And like the opening two minute scenes is the main character like getting in the bathtub and like going to town on herself. And I look over at this w- nameless woman that I won't name on here. And she just kind of wide eyed looked at me like, are you kidding me? Like, right what'd now? you bring me to? I know, and I didn't see it either. I'm like, and I look at her, I'm like, dude, I heard this was an amazing film. She's like, oh yeah, really? It's an amazing film, Sean? You just, you're just like I'm just, just as surprised as you I are. I am. This is amazing, but I'm not going to tell her to stop. No, but the film was so great. So apparently, you turn into Al Pacino when you're defending movies. I do. I do. <laughs> oh, this film is great. <laughs> but the film is great. I'm not going to recommend it though because I reused mine for the night. <laughs> so anyway, with all that in mind. Let's pick our movie for next time, shall we? Oh, Major Sam. So, yeah, we have a, out of a list of 118 movies, we enlist the help of our friendly random number generator AI, Major Samantha, to help us pick our next movie. And between 1 and 118, she has selected... Beep, pop, boop, boop, beep. Thank you. Number 76, which is a 2004 film directed by Alex Proyas and starring Will Smith. It is iRobot. Yes! Dude, I loved this film when it came out, and I love Will Smith. All right, so iRobot will be our film for next time. Please watch it with us, and if you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. It helps drive us up the charts as well as help people like you find the show. We are across the spectrum of social media with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at ForceFed Sci-Fi. You can check out and download episodes at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find podcasts. And please subscribe so you never miss an episode. And finally, you can check out our website, forcefedsci-fi.com, for show notes and links to all of our social media. So for myself and Sean Colt, we will see you next time. Force Fed Sci-Fi is written and hosted by Sean Culp and Chris Rupp. Website design, associate producer, and editing by Jeremy Kesky. Artwork designed by Mike Berger. Theme music composed and performed by Custom Anthem.